Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV. And just because we're doing one of our different time of day shows, a welcome to everybody who is new to watching a live show. We normally do our shows at 7 p.m. UK time, but this is a, a 9 a.m. UK time. So we've got more people watching from Australia, from New Zealand. If this is your first live show, welcome to welcome to what we're doing here. And as always, don't forget the information you need is in the description below. You'll find links to my guests' websites, their books, uh, our uh, merchandising links, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But anyway, joining me today is Dr. Glenn Harper, who will be taking us through the Second New Zealand Division's campaign in North Africa, which, like, like El Alamein, the Tunisian fighting involved forces from across the empire, and their role is fascinating and sometimes overlooked. Uh, and it will connect a little bit with what we were talking about yesterday with Kevin Hemel and Task Force Benson, because we're talking about that last final push. Well, we'll be getting before that as well, but the last final push in La in in March and April towards Tunis. So without further ado, I will bring Glenn in. So it's evening where you are. Good evening, Glenn. How are you today? Yeah, good, thanks. Uh, pleasure to be back. So, I mean, as I said in the top of the show there, it, it is the Tunisian campaign like El Alamein before. It was an international affair, and as always, the nations mm. that write about it tend to kind of focus on their own involvement. So Americans talk about their arrival of their tank forces and Patton yeah. looms large. Mm. The British, you know, we talk about the, the, the longevity of our campaign. And for New Zealanders, uh, it, again, it's a continual waste of a campaign. So for someone like yourself, do you see the post-torch um, campaign as being separate to the El Alamein campaign earlier? Or is it kind of one big campaign in terms of the the, the progression and the ideas? Well, I think for the people who were actually there at the time, this is just one long campaign, and it does seem interminable. And i got to say, by the end of it, uh, some of our troops and some of our uh, senior commanders are really tired, and and, uh, and particularly uh, General Kippenberger I'll talk about, who makes, uh, I think, one of his crucial errors because of that. Of that. So they see it as one long campaign. However, um, I've got to say the Tunisian campaign is very little known about in New Zealand. You know, the desert campaign is, but it seems to stop at El Alamein. But the various attempts to uh, cut off Rommel with the left hooks, the fighting at uh, at um, the Marath line um, and the Battle of Medanine and Takruna, um, is, that tends to get forgotten. Takruna is probably a little bit more well known because there was a... Um, and I'll cover this in my talk. There was a, a Maori soldier was um, ringman of the Victoria Cross, and it was overruled uh, for what seems to be the most pernicious reasons, um, and that caused a bit of a corsalia back here in New Zealand. But basically, the Tunisian campaign is not a campaign New Zealanders think much about at all. It usually stops with our LMA. Well, that's you know, that's an interesting point of view, and I say I think it's generally I think for the British interest definitely wanes after El Alamein. That seems to be kind of the highlight, the and it feels yeah. that torch, as I say, is something separate. But it's, as we're kind of you know talking about over these two weeks, that you know we say it's very much continuation. But anyway, you've come on with a PowerPoint. We'll do questions kind of probably at the end, I think, today, folks. But though there are some as we go along. Um, yeah. we'll do them as we go along. We've already got a question. I know you'll cover this, Glenn, but Ian, Ian is saying, so when did New Zealanders first arrive in North Africa? Uh, well, they were there from the, from the oh, well, from about uh, 19, late 1939, not late 1940. They didn't actually get involved in the North African cam campaigns until uh, Crusader was the big one, so November 1941. But, of course, they did Greece and Crete. They were their first uh, big campaigns, and they were, they were both failures. Um so they've been in North Africa for, for quite some time, and this is the outline of my presentation, brief introduction. I'm going to talk about their arrival in Tripoli and what they actually did there, because um, there are some, several uh, things that happen which are really important in terms of the campaign itself, but also in terms of New Zealand military history. I'm going to talk about a battle which is largely unknown, which seems to get forgotten about, the Battle of Medanine, uh, which is in Tunisia, um, and is really Rommel Swan Song. So I'll cover that. I'll cover outflanking the Marath Line, talk about the um, award of a Victoria Cross to uh, to a, new, a Maori warrior, the first time uh, awarded to a Maori serving in New Zealand uniform. Look at the last two camp, the very last campaign, which is around Amphitivale and Takruna, and talk about this uh, case about the Maori soldier who was recommended but did not get the VC and try and come up with some type of end and significance in, in North Africa. So that's the outline of my talk. Uh, we'll start with uh, with a 
brief introduction. Um, as we know, the Battle of Al Alamein, 23rd of October to 4th of November, in which the New Zealanders have been intimately involved, was really the, the turning point battle in the campaigns in North Africa. But it did coincide with Operation Torch, the Allied invasion of French North Africa. And of course, the combination of defeat at Al Alamein and Operation Torch uh, had a profound impact on Adolf Hitler. He was furious with the defeat um, and also quite annoyed that Rommel had ignored his orders to stand fast. And he was furious with the shiftiness of the Vichy French, who he thought didn't put up much of a struggle or, or, or had fought very hard to defend their colonial uh, empire. So he made the decision to send massive reinforcements to North Africa. And they are massive. From mid-November 1942 to January, end of January 1943, some 243,000 men, 856,000 tonnes of supplies and equipment arrived in Tunisia by sea and air. Um, they would eventually form another army, uh, the 5th Panzer Army, plus their uh, reinforcements of Italians. Um, so the Axis forces actually in Tunisia um, actually outnumber the Allies and it's where they would make their last stand. Mm. And what that means for the New Zealanders who unlike the Australians, decide to keep their land, their ground forces in North Africa and not bring them back to fight in the Pacific campaign. What it means for the New Zealanders is there's five months of tough, hard fighting, which will see the New Zealanders involved in some of the crucial battles of the campaigns last months. And I start with the entry um, into Tripoli. Um, the New Zealand division entered Tripoli on the 23rd of January 1943. They, they weren't the first troops there. They were beaten by the by the third of SARS and some other units, but they were pretty close behind. And this is actually the Maori Battalion, um, who were the first New Zealand troops to enter the to enter the city. They would remain in Tripoli there for what Kippenberger says was six very enjoyable and interesting uh, weeks. So what did they do? Um, they did several things. Obviously, opportunity for rest and recreation. They also had the big Churchill Parade on the 4th of February, uh, 1943, where Churchill has, uh, has seen that Freiburg's redeemed himself. Uh, Churchill and Freiburg, General Freiburg, were actually friends. Yeah. But Churchill was furious that Freiburg had lost Crete and didn't speak to him for didn't speak to him for over a year. He's happy now that the New Zealanders have been involved in El Alamein, and there's this big march past, and Churchill uh, heaps praise upon Freiburg and describes him, and I'm quoting, the salamander of the British Empire. Now, I have to say uh, that confused everybody because most New Zealanders and even Freiburg didn't know what the hell a salamander was. Um, Freiburg thought he'd called him a cooking pot. You know, he said to his uh, to his aide, did he just call me a cooking pot? He said, uh, don't think so, sir. He called you a salamander. And, of course, they rush to their dictionaries and find out that a salamander is actually a mythical lizard that can live in fire and survive. So I was quite comfortable being in, in, in the heat, particularly in the flames. And and so Freiburg then adopts it, is quite happy with that description, adopts it as a coat of arms, and it's the coat of arms of Freiburg High School here and uh, up the road in, in Palmerston North. And Freiburg would describe it as the most impressive and, and moving parade of, of, of his career. What else did they do? Um, they were part of uh, Eighth Army Chute, a tactical exercise without troops for the 1st Army and the US 2nd Corps, where they were actually put on a few demonstrations and people would comment on it. I have to say, um, both General Patton and Beetle, Beetle Smith were there in attendance, and Patton spent most of the shoot staring at the ceiling and chewing gum and then said it meant nothing to him afterwards. So he, he, made, he made quite an impression. <laughs> the other thing that they did was that the New Zealanders were involved in helping clear up the, uh, up the damage and the, especially to, to, to the docks, and they were there unloading um, supplies for the 8th Army. And it was during this time um, that uh, the, uh, the Maori Battalion were unloading supplies and a huge explosion happened and killed about four men and, dam and destroyed an uh, awful lot of supplies. Um, Montgomery wasn't very happy with that and marched in Kippenberger and said, your men were smoking. I told them not to. I want them punished. Um, Kippenberger said, well, I don't think there's any proof of that, sir. He says, well, when I say they were smoking, they were smoking. And Kippenberger uh, basically stood up to him and said, well, I don't think there's any proof. He said, well, see that it doesn't happen, happen again. So... Um, 
uh, Kip and Berger and Montgomery are having a, a bit of a clash, but I'm glad Kip actually stood up to him because not everything Montgomery said was was actually true. Big things that happened for the New Zealanders in Tripoli. The very for the first time in over a year, they received reinforcements. The eighth reinforcement arrived. The first reinforcements the New Zealand Expeditionary Force had had in this period since October 1941. So this is February 43. So from October 41 to February 43, they haven't received a single reinforcement, despite all of the um, losses that, that, that they've been suffering. So they received this reinforcement, 100 officers, 3,000 men, which the official history says it helped give new life to the division. And the other thing that happened um, it, while, they, while they were in Tripoli is they received these, these brand new 17-pounder anti-tank guns known as the Pheasants, and they, one of their anti-tank regiments received 16 of these new guns. They were much better than the original two-pounder, and I've got the picture of a pheasant here compared with a two-pounder in the desert. They had a very high muzzle velocity. They had a very good range and hitting power. It was more than a match for the German 88 millimeter. So they've actually got these anti-tank guns. So now they not only did they have six-pounders and two-pounders, but they've got these 17-pounders as well, which will pack a hell of a punch against any armor that they encounter. And then just to ask you a question, and, and while you're having a sip of water, I mean, we, we made a big deal of talking about how the Americans are arriving and they're having to learn yeah. you know, how to fight the Germans, bring everything for the first time. And that yeah. a, presents a set of problems. How do you take a unit like the New Zealand Division, who have been at it, as you said yourself, for you know, a year and a half before, and how do you re-motivate them? Okay, they've yeah. had a little bit of R&R, &R, uh, but yeah. you know, you're know, you going into another slogging campaign. The terrain in Tunisia it arguably is worse than the desert because you've got mountains and cold and sleet and snow coming into, in, yeah. into the early. So how, yeah. you know, was there any particular recipe for success that the, the, the Kiwi commanders used to kind of pick them up for one more fight with a was it, uh, in, you know, that we're going to thrash the Germans this time? We, this time we're on the, we're on the front foot. How, how did they go about keeping everybody's, you know, morale up? Um, well, certainly when you're winning, uh, morale is slop is better than better than True. when you're losing. But by now, you know, all of their commanders are seasoned veterans. There's been a lot of promotion through the ranks. The brigadiers are exceptionally talented. Um, we've got and we've got Kippenberg and General Gentry, and there's this trust in Freiburg. But there's also a carrot that's dangling before them too: is that once this campaign is finished, there's going to be a, a three-month furlough scheme for the right. oldest veterans, so they will go be able to go back to New Zealand and have so, have a longer rest recreation and catch up with their uh, with their families. I have to say the furlough scheme causes nothing but problems for the New Zealand division, but that's another story and slightly beyond on the, 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 the scope of this. So they are, they are motivated. Their, their okay. morale is really high. Um, and, but part of why they brought the Americans and the First Army over was to actually pass on some lessons that yeah. you know, they'd learned during the during this campaign. But I have to say the Americans, particularly um, uh, particularly Pat and Beetle Smith and some others, weren't really keen on being taught lessons by British or Commonwealth forces. They they tend to think that they can't teach them very much, and they, <laughs> they won't. And they, they do. They make their own mistakes, you know, they, and, yeah. and they make the same mistake. Same happened in, in the First World, of course, when the, when the Americans arrived as well. So um, we have the New Zealand at Tripoli. Um, everybody's had a little bit of rest and recreation. Montgomery has followed up Rommel's withdrawal with very two weak divisions, only two, the 51st Highlanders and the 7th Armoured. And they push on to a place called Medanine, which is actually across the border in Tunisia, some 270 miles from Tripoli. And you can see where that um, is on this map here. There's Tripoli on the coast. Hopefully I can use my mouse and you can no, see that. No, you can't, can't use the mouse. Mouse doesn't work, but we can just we, we can see it. Don't worry. I go Tripoli and you'll see Medanine just across the border in, in, in Tunisia. Now, Rommel has uh, given the Americans, uh, the American Second Corps, a bloody nose at Kazarine, and he sees that that gives him some breathing space to turn back and to hopefully do the same to Montgomery's advancing 8th Army particularly with those small forces that he's pushed forward to, uh, to, to Medanine. And 
Montgomery has committed his cardinal sin. He's unbalanced his army. Um, you know, he always wanted balance before he get, before he committed an attack. He's unbalanced it. He's only got two weak divisions at Medanine leading from the front, and he suddenly learns through ultra intelligence that Rommel is going to turn around and attack these forces on the 3rd of March, 1943. So he's forewarned that it's happened. So Montgomery rushes forth uh, for, from the 28th of February, as much force as he can get, particularly the mobile mobile force. And the New Zealand division is one of those forces rushed to Medanine, and they're told to get there as quickly as they can, and they manage to do it in 12 hours. And they take up position along the front at Medanine. And this is the position that they, they take up. Along the in the north, we have the 51st Highland Division in the center, the 21st Gu uh, Guards Brigade, and only one brigade of New Zealanders. You can see them in in the, in the south or at the bottom of that that mm -hmm. uh, picture. You have five New Zealand Brigade, and you've got three battalions in the front line: 28th Maori Battalion, 21st Battalion, and 23rd. The armor is held back. But all the anti-tank guns are pushed forward, even the even the new pheasants, the 17-pounders, although they're told not to use the pheasants until, unless they're really needed because they want to keep them as a, as a bit of surprise. Now, Kippenberger is the commander of the 5th New Zealand Brigade, and he, lie, he prepares what he described, and I'm quoting from his uh, book, Infantry Brigadier, our masterpiece in laying out a defensive position under desert conditions. He has defence in depth. He has the whole front line covered by anti-tank guns. In fact, he said one of the problems was he had so many anti-tank guns he didn't actually know what to do with them, which is a, which is a nice, uh, nice wow. uh, prob problem to have. As I say, the pheasants are there, but they're, they're going to be used as a last resort. Now, they're expecting an attack and they're ready for attack on the 3rd of March, 1943, but Rommel has to delay it because he doesn't have uh, enough equipment, fuel and, and munitions and so forth. So he builds it up and he does make an attack with three Panzer divisions. As you can see, their, their attack line there with 15 Panzer, 21 and 10 Panzer division. It is an unmitigated disaster for Rommel. Um, and I'm, as I'm so surprised, not, not more is made of it. He attacked with 124 tanks, 16 battalions of infantry. He lost half his tanks in the space of an hour and a half. 52 tanks, German tanks are destroyed on the battlefield. No British ones are lost at all. And it showed how much the 8th Army had learned mm. and how to entail a counter these armoured thrusts of which Rommel was so good. So what is the significance of this battle? This is Rommel's swan song. He left North Africa three days later and he didn't return. And the British Army have now seen how to fight this, these, these panzer armies. The British Army realises that they shouldn't use tanks on tanks, that to destroy tanks, you leave that to your anti-tank guns and your artillery. You have defence in depth and you commit the armour to kill infantry and pursue um, to pursue pursue a defeated enemy. Medanine is the most successful defensive battle in North Africa. Now I'm going to go have a slight diversion here. This is obviously a very impressive battle. Montgomery tours, uh, tours the battlefield later, comes across Kippenberger's uh, 5th Brigade and its defensive positions, and he's really impressed. And he says to Kippenberger, um, boy, you've done really well here. Uh, what principles have you followed? Uh, Kippenberger tried to uh, dismiss this. Oh, well, sir, you know, we've uh, had plenty of time, blah, blah. And Montgomery says to him, no, no, I want you to tell me what principles you've followed in defence. And Kippenberger says to him, well, sir, I always follow eight principles in a defensive position like this. So I go for con concealment. I have uh, make sure that each position is mutually supporting. They have good observation. We've got defence in depth. And he rattled off eight principles of defence, right? Anyway, the very next day, Montgomery is tours the battlefield with all his senior officers in tow and is teaching them lessons. And he comes to the 5th, 5th New Zealand Brigade defensive position and he says to them, look at this defensive position. It's a model defensive position. See how they've followed my eight principles of defence. <laughs> you know? so, so, yeah, Montgomery a being arrogant, whatever next, yeah. Glenn. <laughs> yeah. but just, if he'd just been writing a universe... 
university so it would have been accused of plagiarism but never mind but just to uh, address your point about why we don't talk about rommel's advance previously i think it's because it goes against the narrative that a lot of people hold that rommel is brilliant i think that's yeah, why yeah. we don't talk about it there's still a whole lot of people out there they comment on my channel some of these people about how yeah. brilliant rommel is he was a genius why wasn't you know he was the best general of world war ii why didn't we have him on the allied side etc 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 and, and and there's an example of Rommel fucking up, basically. So I think yeah, that's yeah. why it doesn't make the the, 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 yeah. the narrative because it goes against what people want to believe. Oh, oh, absolutely. You know, there's this this long-standing, I think it's a bit, bit of a myth, the, the Rommel legend. He's the commander of genius, you know. And in some ways, the uh, British have the, only themselves to blame. I mean, they, they built yeah, him up. And even Churchill says, you know, he's a great general. What a great general we've got against us. But... He makes mistakes like everybody else, but uh, but people tend to tend to ignore those. Um, I'm going to move on now and move from yeah. Medellin to the next big engagement for the New Zealanders, and this is the the Marath Line battle. Um, the Marath Line was a formidable defensive position. It follows a natural obstacle, the Wadi Zigzal, which you can, which hopefully you can see on that map. Which runs, uh, which is a natural tank obstacle with steep banks of up to 70 feet high. Uh, the northwest side has been fortified by the French, and it runs across the coastal plain from Zarat, which you can hopefully see in the in the north, to to, to yep. Jane in the south, and it links into the Matamata Mata hills beyond. Um, now, the original plan was that Montgomery was going to assault this line on the 20th, the largest set-piece battle that the 8th Army uh, will fight since El Alamein. It's called Operation Pugilist, and Montgomery's aim, and I'm quoting from his uh, battle plan, is to destroy the enemy now opposing 8th Army in the Marath Line and advance and capture Sfax. Now, it combines two elements. There's a frontal assault by the British, by most of the British Eighth Army, uh, in a, 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 at the at that wadi, which you can see on the map. While there is a gigantic left hook prepared, whereby a huge force will advance, will initially go due south, trek around the Matamata Hills, start advancing north, and cut in through a position called the Tabaga Gap. That's a journey of around 300 miles, and it's, it's so, so it's quite a significant journey over very rough terrain. And that task is given to the New Zealand Corps. The New Zealand Division is now boosted to a core size, and the force is quite formidable. It consists of the 2nd New Zealand Division, which is probably at the heart of it, the 8th Armoured Brigade, which has three regiments of heavy tanks, the King's Dragoon, Dragoon Guards of armoured cars, some regiments of medium artillery, a free French column and other units. In all, that's a total force making that journey of 25,600 men, 112 artillery guns, 172 anti-aircraft guns and 150 tanks, which is more tanks than the Africa Corps has at the time. It's a powerful force to be coming in behind your defensive position. Now, the New Zealand Corps uh, conducted a difficult night march, uh, and they reached Tabaga Gap on the night of the 20th of March. Uh, the, the, the timing was to be uh, in time with that frontal assault. The frontal assault on the Marath line failed, and I've got to say it was a very weak uh, assault. It was one infantry division and, and one armoured brigade. It failed, but Freiburg also failed to deliver a solid blow to the rear. The New Zealand Corps captured several Italian positions, but Freiburg did not deliver the full attack that, that he, he was supposed to. He was cautious and hesitant about this opportunity for a quick victory. And at one stage, the commander of 6th New Zealand Brigade, uh, Brigadier Gentry, William Gentry, had actually punched a hole right through the Tobago Gap and penetrated halfway through it. And he says to Freiburg, we're right through now. We can do anything we like. Commit the 8th Armoured Brigade. But Freiburg did not do it. Um, and he's largely responsible for the failure of... Um, Operation Pugilist. 
Now, Montgomery's got a problem. His plan has failed, a um, bit like at Al Alamein, the original plan failed. And once again, he does something. And this is where I think he proves his generalship, Montgomery. He changes the plan. He switches the direction of attack. Instead of putting the emphasis on a full frontal assault, he's going to shift the bulk of the attack through the Tabaga Gap and reinforce where there has been some limited success. And to do that, he sends the complete 1st Armoured Division, another 130 tanks with its own, uh, own integral uh, anti-tank guns and, and artillery. And he sends who, who one of his most trusted commanders to the area as well. Now, this is a difficult situation because it's really hard to know who's in command of this, of what is going to become Operation Supercharge 2, because Horrocks on the, on the right and Freiburg on the left are the same rank. And Freiburg is the, officially the core commander, but Horrocks is the commander of the, of the is commanding first armoured division and is also a core commander. Now, the, you, you need to be aware that Freiburg did not like Horrocks. Freiburg did, did, did not like him and did not make him welcome. And I cannot find a reason for it, apart from the fact he regarded him as a bit of an interloper, a new boy, didn't have sand in his, boot, in his boots. Now, about 15 years ago, I interviewed Freiburg's uh, chief staff officer for this operation, uh, who was then at the time a major, but he's Sir Leonard Thornton. And he told me that this is the only time he knew where General Freiburg behaved, and I'm quoting his words, behave really badly. Um, his staff were embarrassed because they quite liked Horrocks. Um, but um, Horrocks got on with it, ignored the insults that Freiburg, uh, Freiburg uh, put on him. And the reality, I have to say, and, uh, you know, I could be, uh, uh, you know, lambasted for being in New Zealand. The, the, the reality is Freiburg is a very good divisional commander, but every time he's elevated above divisional to core yep. command, he struggles. And you only have to look at Crete. You only have to look at this at what's this operation here, Tobago Gap, and then Casino to follow to realise that he is a bit out of his depth when he's commanding a corps. Um, he's a fighting divisional commander and probably one of the best, but as a corps commander, he struggles, I, I, I think. You know, people in New Zealand will find that uh, they'll be sacrilegious, but, but, but never mind. 26th of March is the date for this new attack, Operation Supercharge 2, and it is a stunning success which breaks clear through the Tabaga Gap. And the, 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 here's, here's the plan for it. Got the New Zealanders on, 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 on attacking on the left, another brigade on the right, and then punching the, through the 1st Armoured Division right clean through the gap. And it was immensely successful. Several reasons for it. It's a Blitzkrieg-style operation where the, um, the the Eighth Army uses 20 squadrons of Spitfires, Kitty Hawks, and Hurricane Tank Busters, providing providing really solid close air support, something they've been wanting, wanting for years. There's this perfect co coordination between ground and air forces and excellent cooperation between armour and artillery. And 1st Armoured Division performed magnificently in this battle. And I say, at last, the Allies were learning how to make war and how to get it right. And I've got to say, it's, uh, this is March 1943, so it's taken them uh, quite some time. The New Zealand Corps actually push, follows the 1st Armoured Division and catches um, captures the town of Garbs on the 29th of uh, March. This is the this is the Baga left hook, and it's the greatest and final of these left hooks um, in North Africa, and it's very successful. There's one sidetrack to it, though, and this is the battle around point 209. 209 was a hill on the uh, right flank of Tavaga Gap. Um, it was uh, the uh, the it was the uh, the objective of the Maori battalion to take it, but it had been very well defended. Point 209 had not been damaged during the aerial bombardment, and the armour had sheared away from it because there was an 88 millimetre gun firing into their flanks. And after losing five tanks, they decided that they would leave it alone. So the basically the the Maori battalion has to clear this position, and the German defenders are from the 164th Division, and they fight tenaciously. And fight, in fact, this fight goes on two for two days after the gap has been, has been cleared. The, the battle around um, around point two oh nine, it goes on for for the twenty sixth, 
and the 27th of March, a 24-hour epic. And I have to say that the Maori soldiers at one stage actually ran out of ammunition and resorted to throwing rocks um, at the German defenders wow. when, they, when they ran out. This man here, uh, inspirational uh, leader, uh, Second Lieutenant Timoana Nui Akiwa Naramu, was awarded a uh, posthumous Victoria Cross, the first Victoria Cross awarded to a Maori serving with New Zealand forces. Um, point 209 was finally taken on the afternoon of the 27th of March after a company attack and which captured 231 German POWs, of which half of them were wounded. This is one of those tenacious fights between two opponents that, that that really dislike each other and none of them wants to give up. Um, Maori battalion losses were extremely heavy, uh, 98 casualties, of which 76 were wounded, 22 killed, most from most from one company. And Kippenberger, who went over 0.209 the next day, and there's a memorial that's been built to the Maori battalion on, on the spot, he went over with a Mara Battalion commanding officer and he described it as the in, in his in his uh, autobiography as this the most horrible scene of slaughter. There were more dead and mangled Germans everywhere, more than I'd seen in a small area since the Psalm in 1916. And uh, Kippenberger was on the Psalm in the third phase on the 15th of September um, 1916. So we're through the Your signal seems to have jammed a bit, Glenn. Hang on. Folks, seem to, Glenn seems to be jammed a bit. We'll hope you bring him back in a second. Mm. Oh, we're back. Yeah, yeah, we, we, you, you jammed for a few seconds there. No worries, you're back now. Good. Well, okay. just while you're, um, um, you're, you're refocusing, we had a couple of questions earlier on. One is, uh, someone asked about the quote. I know Rommel has left the battle now, but, uh, someone asked about the quote Rommel supposedly said about the Aussies and the Kiwis. Did you want yeah. about whether or not it was true or not? Do you want to address that one? Yeah, no, it's not true. Okay, good. Definitely not true. It, 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 it's a myth, and I've scoured the Rommel papers and I've read every comment he made about the New Zealanders and Australians. He said they were fine infantry and the elite of the Eighth Army, but he never said if only I had a battalion of Maori or if only I had a division of Australians, I could conquer the world. No myths. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, and then the other thing is just about the Maori Battalion is that it's interesting now with 80 years on is that when I was researching for this series, there's an awful lot of information about the Maori Battalion online now. There's there's film footage, yeah. there's there's yeah, yeah, there's yeah. Th there's stuff there. So clearly at the time, given that there was footage of them there, they were they were newsworthy back then. So it wasn't that they've only been brought into the story now because of diversity and because of trying to make yeah. things correct and accept that the fact that forces yeah. are made of different colors and they they were newsworthy back at the time weren't they oh absolutely they, they were um the particularly as the you know this is the first time we've actually had an infantry unit made up entirely of maori soldiers uh infantry um an infantry battalion in the first world war they were a pioneer battalion so not up up close so much except except at gallipoli um the only thing I'd say to it is that it also obscures as much as it reveals because you're looking at about 3,600 New Zealanders who served in the Maori Battalion, but in all, all told there were 15,000 New Zealanders who served with New Zealand military forces. There are a lot in the Navy and a lot in the Air Force, and they tend to get forgotten about, unfortunately. But, but, right. um, it's it's, it's yeah, the way it goes yeah. on. You know, when when yeah. a highlight or spotlight falls on one particular group yeah, of people, yeah. It yeah, means yeah. other people not in the beam get a bit forgotten, but at least at yeah. least there at least there is interest, and that's yeah. that's good. But anyway, back yeah, to you. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, despite the success at Tobago Gap, the Germans withdraw in good order and slipped away. I've got to say that's something they prove adept at. They're, they're never were we able to actually cut off and destroy a German retreating army. Um, and I've got to say the Soviets only managed it once to an operation progression. If you have a look at this map, you'll see the Germans. Oh, sorry, the Axis. I should because. Plenty of Italians fighting as well are being squeezed into an ever smaller pocket with the 8th Army coming up from the south and the 1st Army and the US 2nd Corps coming in from the northwest. It's this bit from the south I want to focus on. If you can see that map and if you can find that town of Infiteville, because this is the last fight for the New Zealanders in the North African campaign. So they're getting squeezed in ever, ever smaller. And on the 19th and 20th of April 1943, the New Zealand Division set 
sets off on its last major action to clear the foothills between the town of Infiteville and a hill known as Takruna. And this is part of Operation Oration. And here's the plan for it, a uh, little, little, little bit complicated, but I'm going to refer to the New Zealanders. If you look just to the right to the right side of the slide, you'll see a boundary with 50th, uh, the, the 50th Northumberland Division. You've got the 2nd New Zealand Division with two brigades in line, 6th Brigade on the right and 5 New Zealand Brigade on the left. I'm probably going to focus on 5 Brigade uh, more than more than 6th Brigade because 6th Brigade actually um, have, a, have quite an easy job. 6th Brigade's task is to capture and fight of all and the Fightable plane, five brigade on its left is tasked with securing the hills, particularly uh, one called Takruna and one called slightly to its north called Jebel Burr. Now, I've got to say, Takruna is a formidable feature, and you can see it from, from this picture here. It's a, a rocky outcrop. It rises steeply from the infinitable plain. If you're on top of that, you can see everything moving on that plain below you. It's some 400 to 500 feet, and if you can look at those sheer cliffs, the last mm. 20 feet are almost sheer, and it was really well defended as well. Now, Kippenberger, uh, the one that I know, I actually wrote his biography, um, is in charge of Five Brigade, and it's not his not his finest hour. He underestimated how difficult it was going to be to capture uh, this feature. Uh, what were what his mistakes? He's overconfident, and that confidence uh, does get down the men who think this is going to be a uh, piece of cake. He sets deep objectives with limited time to reach them. They haven't adjusted their timings to this new terrain, and they're sticking to desert timings, particularly for their artillery barrages. They conduct no reconnaissance, but rely only on aerial photographs, and they don't, well, Kippenberger doesn't recognise the tactical importance of this feature. It's the dominating feature, and he commits too few troops to, to, uh, to capture it. What he does is he marches a battalion on either side of it, which is a killing zone on both sides, and then he commits one company to attacking it from the rear. Now, if you look at that feature, that is more than a company objective. It needs far more troops than that. The other thing that he does is he doesn't keep a reserve and he totally underestimates the uh, will of the defenders. They seem to be predominantly Italian and, you know, they don't give them their, their um, don't treat them with the respect that they deserve. In short, this is his greatest tactical blunder. He marches his brigade into a lethal killing ground and the casualties that result reduces him almost to tears and it's, it becomes a real soldier's battle. The, the fight to take Takruna lasts for two days, two days of heavy fighting. Troops from the Maori Battalion uh, initially captured it after a grueling climb, and to get to the very top, they have to haul themselves up on signal cables that the Germans had, had put there. They're actually, uh, the, the, the hill is, is taken again in a counterattack, so the Maori Battalion at attacks it uh, again and captures it for a second time, largely by the work of one Lance Sergeant, uh, Hani Manahi, and so other soldiers join in the fight as well. Um, this uh, tack ruin is taken, but the cost is really high. 404 wounded in action, 46 killed, 86 missing. Kippenberger has suffered a casualty rate of 50% for the soldiers that he's committed um, to this action, which is astounding. Now, I'm going to talk about the Manahi case because the Tatgruner is taken largely through the leadership of this Lance Sergeant on the right of this picture, who not only captured it once, but led people back to capture it twice. And the Corps Commander, uh, Horrocks, who uh, we, we've met before, Lieutenant General Brian Horrocks, watched Manahi and a small group of soldiers take Takruna, and he wrote in his autobiography that it was the most gallant feat of arms I witnessed in the course of the war. This is the guy that uh, com you know commands 30 Corps on the way to Arnhem. So he sees an awful lot during the war, and he picks this out as the single most gallant action he witnessed during the course of the war. Now, Manahi, on the right, is recommended for the Victoria Cross, and it's supported by Kippenberger, it's supported by Freiburg, it's supported by Horrocks, and it's supported by Montgomery. 
But after leaving North Africa, somewhere in the halls of uh, London, it's downgraded to an immediate uh, Distinguished Conduct Medal, to a DCM. And for years, Maori leaders in uh, New Zealand believed that this guy had suffered a gross injustice, and they lobbied to have the DCM upgraded to a Victoria Cross, even going so far as to make a claim to our Waitangi Tribunal, which is a tribunal sent up, held our, our foundation document, the Treaty of Waitangi. Didn't happen. October 2006, the Queen instead gifted an altar cloth, a special sword from her father's collection and a personal letter. Was an injustice done to Manahi, undoubtedly, um, but i got to say he's alone. Uh, many, he's not alone. Uh, many yeah. others have been recommended for the Victoria Cross and not it. You can't expect war to be fair. I mean, fortunes of war are never yeah. fair. Some people get it. Some people don't. You know, some people survive. You know. Anyway, I'm now moving to the end of this talk, and I'll wrap it up reasonably quickly because some of the stuff you might have already covered. You're aware that the Axis forces are being defeated on the, in the air and the ground, and they're being starved of supplies as well. Every air and naval movement is picked up through ultra intelligence, and it's stopped. All convoys to North Africa from, from Germany are halted by the end of March. There's an attempt to maintain an air bridge, but after losing over 200 transport aircraft, they stop that. So with no fuel, limited ammunition, and being squeezed into ever smaller pockets with their backs to the Mediterranean, Axis forces capitulate. 275,000 Axis soldiers laid down their arms, which is a defeat similar to Stalingrad. And it eliminates the uh, the Germans from the Mediterranean. And here's an image of the ever increasing uh, small pockets and those uh, little circles of how many prisoners are captured when those when those positions are taken. On the 13th of May, there is the surrender, and here we have temporary corps commander General Freiburg accepting the surrender of Marshal Giovanni Mises' 1st Italian Army and Major General Kurt von Liebenstein's 164th uh, Africa uh, Division. So let me wrap up with the significance. Um, this, um, while North Africa was always a sideshow for the Germans, um, they made this critical mistake in 1942 to reinforce failure. The belated decision to reinforce act the axis in North Africa after Torch delayed the outcome of what happened in North Africa by some months, but it magnified the defeat tenfold. And if you look at the history of the war, El Alamein, Medanine, the outflanking of the Marath Line, the Axis surrender in Tunisia, are parts of this major shift, which we call the turn of the tide. And the second New Zealand division is at the forefront of nearly all of these victories in North Africa. It is the time when Germany has lost the initiative. And I love this last line of the New Zealand official history on North Africa, where he says, and it's quite evocative, I think, that not for nothing had these men come 10,000 miles from their homeland in the New World to play their part in restoring a balance in the old. What it mm. means, I think, is that Nazi Germany could not win now unless these coalitions against it fell apart. It's like Germany in 1914 and 1918. It can't win a war on more than one front and expect to win. However, as a big however, this is May 1943 and the war is far from over. And I'll take any questions or comments you might have. This was taken from the 75th anniversary, and I like that line from Sir, Sir Harold Alexander, Sir, as my duty report, the Tunisian campaign is over. We are masters of the North African shore. But it's now 80 years ago that these events happened. Paul, that's it from me. Well, I mean, as you as last time, brilliant. Um, so a couple of things there about that quote about coming, um, you know, 10,000 miles. Of course, one of the things that came up uh, last week um, we were talking about logistics in the Pacific is of course some people who say it wasn't Australia Australia New Zealand's fight because you know it, it was about the empire but of course there is that aspect of course of of the fact that Australia needs fuel New Zealand needs that yeah that you know you are protecting to some extent your interests globally yeah. By, yeah. by participating in Mediterranean so I think that's a slightly when people say oh they were it wasn't really their fight you you know like yeah. other other nations you you do mm. require imports as well you know so you yeah. know so 
I think it is a global effort as well. So that's that's my first point. Um, yeah. The second is someone asked Willie Robertson asked is the the the, the failure to, to for the second chap to receive the VC. It can't be racism as such because they'd already uh, they'd already mm. given a VC to a Maori. So it can't it can't mm. be that, can it? No, no. And be honest, nobody knows why it was downgraded. Some people said, oh, there must have been a quota system, you know, but there is no quota system for Victoria Crosses because um, a New Zealand battalion got three in, in, in Greece. You know, it's it, it just I, I don't know why why it wasn't. There was a rumour, too, that uh, that at Takruna, some Maori soldiers um, in the fury of battle had thrown Italians off the off the you know prisoners off the top of the cliff. And, and that that may have, may have been been the case. Can I just back to your comment about you know uh, you know we're best to serve um the new zealanders and australians had a major disagreement about this and it was yeah. the, the the lowest year because the australians brought their troops back and put pressure on new zealand to do the same but they were both looking at the war differently the australians yeah. and their leader john curtin said when the pacific war happened said this is a new war this is our war and this is where we need to fight the New Zealanders didn't do that. They saw the war as a continuous whole, and basically they wanted to make their effort where it would count. And they asked Churchill for his views, and they asked Roosevelt for his views. And Roosevelt said, you know, look, they're trained to fight Germans. They're doing really well. Keep them there, and we'll send some Marines to New Zealand, you know, to train, and that will, will alleviate your... And that, they, they accepted that. They considered it three times in Parliament, and each time they came to the decision, we're best to leave them there. That's where the effort's going to count because it's the same war and you know we're making the, that our contribution there and it doesn't matter where we make it so long as we do make a contribution whereas the australians thought no the pacific war is our war and that's where we need to put our put most of our ground forces and that's a very good point because you know now we have an anzac day was what a few days ago is that yeah. we do and by we i mean non-aussie non-kiwi but Aust uh, american british Australians, we do tend to group your two nations together in the same frame mm -hmm. you know so and don't forget that australia and new zealand forces were, were involved in these and we're talking about first world war second world war but forgetting mm -hmm. that as you made very clear there that they have different ideas about how to wage the war which is the the, the greatest I issue as well indeed with torch is that the americans and british have different mm. ideas about how to wage mm. the wars. And in and within those countries, there are different yep. ideas about how to wage the war. And it's one of the things we came up with Kevin last night on the Patton show, or mm. about Task Force Benson, is that different historians refer to tor Torch and the Tunisian campaign by different phrases, in that we all know that Overlord is the starting of a second front. It's got a very precise, that's mm -hmm. its first thing. It's other thing. But some people see our, the Tunisian campaign as it's kind of a learning curve. Some people say mm -hmm. it's about appeasing Stalin. Some people say mm -hmm. it's about shipping in Mediterranean. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it can be it can be assessed in different ways, mm -hmm. depending on your point, point of view. But as you, you made very clearly, that it, it is mm -hmm. a destruction of a huge number of German forces. And, yep. and whether or not the Germans should have committed that second lot of forces is a is a is yep. a question for the ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yep, yep, yep. but it does. I don't think Torch and the Tunisia campaign gets that. It, it doesn't make most people's lists of sort of top ten turning points. I mean, start. Yeah. The, Trevor Sheehan, who's on next week, his handle on Twitter is Af the African Stalingrad. So he he studies Tunisia, and that's what he calls himself. It, it, it is. It is a. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. It, it is. It is a, a calamity for the Germans. On yep. on a par with with Stalingrad, but yet doesn't get referred that way. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, and and of course it's even a more of a calamity for the Italians too, who think, oops, you know, uh, and uh, though their uh, island of Sicily will be invaded shortly, and then uh, and then you know the mainland as well, where there is a, also another front that's uh, that's opened up. Of course, Americans are reluctant to go to Italy, but uh, Churchill sees this as a you know soft underbelly to to mm. to Europe and. And commit some there. So, oh, look, getting back to your point, absolutely, the, the freeing of North Africa from Axis troops is a significant victory for the Allies and a, and a catastrophic loss for the Germans. And the big thing too is, that, and this is this is alluded to in some of the German documents I read. They realise they've lost the initiative now. This is the turning of the tide. Yeah. They they are not are not advancing anymore. They're not dictating terms. They're on the back foot. They've lost the initiative, and they really don't get it back again, except on the rare occasion where they do something surprising, like you know, the Battle of the Bulge, or, or, or something like that. But they're, they're basically on the back foot from this time onwards. Okay, thank you. So my next question is going to be. 
know, I've asked other historians about, about again, this learning curve. So what does Montgomery take away from Tunisia? What does Rommel take away? Who, you know, they end up in Normandy. But the New Zealand division, of course, they, you know, they continue on in Italy. And is, are there any, and we can invite you back to discuss that at some point when we when we get to the, to Italy, but mm. are there mm. any immediate takeaways you can think that the second New Zealand division took away from, from the end, from, and I don't necessarily mean from the kind of the El Alamein earlier part, but the, the Tunisian campaign, I mean, they have the 17 pounder, you made it clear there, but sure, when they sure, get, sure. when they set foot in action next, is there one sure. thing or a couple of things you can say, okay, that's what they learned in Tunisia? Uh, no, what, what they, um, I think they learn most from their mistakes and, uh, Kakruna was far worse than it should have been, and the, and and the, I did interview um, a, a gentry once, and he said, "Look, we were absolutely knackered by the end of that campaign." Not his words. Mm. He said, "We see, we're exhausted, you know, and we basically needed to find some way of uh, resting our, our our senior officers and bringing in some new blood. We needed more reinforcements before we could commit to a larger campaign, and we needed to also make sure that the current people." get enough rest and recreation. Now, Montgomery wanted to use the New Zealand division for the Sicily campaign, um, but the commanders and the government thought that was too soon after North Africa, and they actually refused the use of the New Zealanders because they actually needed, knew the New Zealanders needed a rest. I mentioned that furlough scheme where they sent back um, mm -hmm. uh, several thousand of the oldest serving soldiers, and they came back to New Zealand and had three months off. But then there was a, a kind of a mini mutiny and most of them didn't want to serve again, you know, didn't want to go back and only several hundred came back from the thousands that that that, uh, that had gone home to New Zealand. Um, so they basically, uh, when they get to Italy, um, the commanders are back. Freiburg's had a, a little bit of a rest in New Zealand. Kippenberger hasn't. Kippenberger's come back, but he's had so many speaking engagements and, you know, and briefings and that. Uh, he really hasn't had much of a rest. Um, and uh, and some of their new troops, are, uh, you know, they need a lot more training. So basically it was the fact that the New Zealanders were at, at the end of the North African campaign were not in a fit state to continue and they basically needed to be rebuilt and there was some attempt to do that. Uh, I think uh, Montgomery learned a lot from Metternich when he actually committed his, you know, when he had allowed his army to become unbalanced like he did. I don't think he ever did that again. And he kept uh, tight watching. He's a very cautious commander, Montgomery. Um, and so was Freiburger, which is why he didn't attack at Tobago Gap. Um, as Selena Thornton said to me, when you've stuck your neck out so often as we've had and, and you know, had it almost chopped off, we, you're a bit reluctant to do it again. So that's that's why he didn't uh, put in that attack that he should have earlier at Tobago at Gap. Not no, sure definitely. And, and, and the debates about Montgomery being being showing a lack of aggression will continue for as long as people are talking about World War II history. Montgomery will continue to divide people yeah. Um, yeah. As, as Rommel does. But um, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned Kippenberg. I've just added while you were talking, I've added the link to your to your book, although it's a, I believe it's quite hard to get the Kippenberg book. It's one of your mm -hmm. earlier ones. But mm -hmm. you know, we talk about Freiburg a lot. So Freiburg is one of the few New Zealand figures who is talked out talked about mm. kind of outside of New Zealand, but, but Kippenberger doesn't seem to have made the, mm. the, the, the discussions of other historians. I mean, obviously you, you've written about him. Is he mm. someone we should be looking at more as an example? Oh, oh absolutely. Um, I think he's a, a fine um, commander and comes through the ranks and actually started as a private soldier on the Somme and winds up, you know, as, as a major general. Um, unfortunately, his career is cut short in, uh, in the uh, at casino when he stands on one of those shoe mines and loses both feet. But it does have a, it does have a, it becomes our, our, um, uh, official historian for the New Zealand mm. official histories, but um, certainly not as well known as Freiburg, but I will give a, another plug. He wrote a book called Infantry Brigadier, uh, which is regarded as probably the New Zealand classic of the Second World okay. War. It was highly influential. It went into several printings. It was actually used at the Israeli Staff College as one of their must-read texts. So, uh, so um, if you can't get my book, get Infantry Brigadier, it should be a most lovely, okay. and it is a, is a really good read. And one of the reasons it's a really good read is he's one of the few military commands that actually admits when he got it wrong. And Tech Green okay. is, is one of those things he admits to. Yeah, well worth tracking down if you can get it. Infantry Brigadier by Major General Sir Howard Kippenberger. Okay, Brent. And my last question we talked about the 17 pound, or some, obviously mostly an anti tank gun, but yeah, yeah. it's come up on other shows about the invent. And I forget whether I spoke to you about it because I've done so many of these bloody things now, but yeah. the inventiveness generally of, of, of artillery use within New, Ze New Zealand divisions and indeed the Australians is something that yeah. I think the rest of the world 
without us knowing it, Montgomery yeah. and other and, and the artillery commander in Alamein, whose name escapes me, but the the guy it'll come to me later. As soon as I've put the end of the stream, it'll come to me. But yeah. like you said about the eight lessons of defensive principle that Montgomery borrowed from the from the New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. are artillery principles that are being shared yeah. around. But I don't know that yeah. the rest of the world has understood yeah. that it was often th these units that were that yeah. were the finest things. Yeah. So, what's your opinion about the New Zealand? Are, are you a very good natural user of artillery in the New Zealand forces? Uh, yeah, I think that they have one of the better gunners, a good guy by the name of Steve Weir, um, Major General Steve Weir, who actually um, come, gets to command a British division at the end, at the end of the war. Um, but he, during the time in Syria, actually decides that he's not going to farm out his artillery pieces, so he's going to right. keep them as a concentrated unit and develop several fire patterns, one called Stonks and one called Murder, where you put down a massive barrage on a small area, and it's adopted by, uh, those principles are adopted by the rest of 8th Army. Kirkman is the name I think you're looking yeah, for. Yeah, that's it, Stanley yeah. Kirkman, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. I mean, yeah, I think and, it was and, James, yeah. James yeah. Coleman, I, I think, when he came yeah, on yeah, the show, and he was talking about the fact that, yeah, he's, yeah. and he was a British historian, he was talking about the fact that because the Australian and New Zealand divisions are, you know, yeah, inherently yeah. your your number of forces in, engaging are are less than, than the British yeah. or the Americans, so yeah. therefore you're having to do something with artillery based on the fact you are a, a smaller force, and therefore that's where, that's why, because yeah. it was basically, he was saying you were integrating it better, you were using, you wanted to use shells to, yeah. to, 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 to save lives, and, yeah. and, and that yeah. then spread out, so. Yeah, that's uh, right. Getting back to the 17 pounder, they didn't yeah. use them at Medellin, but they did use them at Takaruna. They, was, they, they were running out of ideas what to do, and they thought, oh, let's see see what kind of damage they can do. And they actually fired a, a barrage of the 17 pounders at, on the defensive positions on Takaruna, and they're quite impressed by the damage that that, that, that were caused. That was caused. Mm -hmm. And Ian Carr, well, you've, you've addressed half of this question because obviously Freiburg, oh no, we talked about Freiburg and Churchill. So Ian Carr is saying, do Kimpenberg and Freiburg comment on Montgomery in their records and diaries? Ah, oh, yes, they do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, they're quite uh, praising of um, of Montgomery, particularly when he took over 8th Army and transformed it. Um, as they were, uh, they were yeah, the New Zealanders were actually quite depressed at the state of Eighth Army after the first Battle of El Alamein. We're talking about J July um, and early September, and there was this talk of, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're still going to have these brigade groups, and then Gott's going to take over the army, and they'd lost all confidence in, in Strafer Gott. So when Montgomery comes, they view him as a, as a breath of fresh air, and Freiburg actually says to him, um, look, uh, I have a charter from the New Zealand government, and you're not going to break up my New Zealand division. And Montgomery says, I don't intend to. I want to fight divisions as divisions. I'm not going to break down a small group. So they're actually very, very praising of him. They do find him difficult to deal with, and they do make some other comments about it. Um, and Kippenberger, an infantry brigadier, you know, he relays that message about the um, at Tripoli and, and you know, Montgomery accusing the Maoris of smoking when he said nobody could mm. smoke around munitions and so forth. And and, and Kippenberg came away and said, thank God I'm not serving in the British Army because yeah. he, would have, he would have had to wear it. Well, that's the thing about Montgomery is how, how he did things and how he mm. explained those things to other people are two different things. He what The, 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 yeah. the results of what he did can, can sometimes be better than just the way he engages with other human yeah, beings. And yeah, that's that yeah, endless yeah. discussion we have about whether or not he was on the spectrum. Was he Asperger's, autistic? You know, yeah, 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 he, he yeah. certainly isn't the yeah. best at, at dealing yeah. with other human beings. And yet, actually, yeah. he's often yeah. quite good at find, coming up with solutions. It's just a, it's a personality yeah. thing. You know, I, as I kind of people who've been on tours with me, I, go, I like Montgomery, but I concede he's a dickhead. That's that. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. As that, a that, commander. Yeah. I don't think there's anybody else who could do what he does better than he does. No, no, but there no. are times you're, you know, you, you're just aghast at the way he deals with people on a human level. You go, what? Just, just yeah, be yeah, a bit yeah. more gracious. Yeah, be a bit yeah, more, yeah. you know. But that's that's yeah. the debate. But um, yeah. so uh, again, it's been fantastic talking to you again. I will invite you back when we get to Italy, and I re remind people that your links to your books are in the description below, and you've written a lot of things over the years, and you've come come at this as a historian and and a former soldier, which is is fantastic. And and I'm glad that you're sharing your knowledge with us because, as we've said before, we, we British Brits and Americans, we need to. Um, to, to broaden out our understanding of this war and understanding that the New Zealand role is, is crucial to understanding how these campaigns were fought. So thank you. You're welcome, Paul, anytime.
Brilliant. So, folks, I'm back again later. Paul, Paul Sparrow is coming on talk about politics again. We're going back to FDR, Churchill, and all the politics behind the the, the daily what well, expecting what the French were going to do and all the differences between the British and American thinking. And that'll be great. And then tomorrow, we uh, I've got two days off. We're back on Friday when Ian Mitchell is talking about the battle for Longstop Hill. And we'll be discussing all that, which will be fantastic. So, Glenn, thanks very much. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. I will see you all again later. Cheers, everybody. Bye.